Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me and my very special guest. You know him from his successful Sirius XM radio uh, programs and from his Seth concert series. And he and his husband, James Wesley, are the creators and hosts of the award-winning Stars in the House, which, of course, benefits the Actors Fund. Please say hello to my dear friend, Seth Radetzky. Hi, Richard. How you doing? How are you doing? Like, first of all, how are you and where are you? Uh, we, oh, this light is so crazy. We got a house upstate a couple of years ago um, when our kid was still in high school and we wanted to move it to a different high school. And then when the pandemic hit, we realized that we couldn't really stay in the city because she has asthma. So we basically got rid of our Upper West Side apartment we, that we were renting. We negotiated our way out of the lease and now we're living up here. It's like, it's called Orange County. It's, you know, it's very nature-y. Now, how big is the family now in the pet menagerie? Like, how many people are in the house? What's it like there? Me and my husband, James, our daughter, Julie, and then in an attached part of the house, James's mom lives, Elizabeth. And then she has two dogs, Christy and Mateo, that we adopted from two different Broadway cruises. We have our dogs, Mandy and Bagel, but... Chrissy and Mateo come over and visit every day. We call them Lenny and Swiggy, the two stupid neighbors. So they're always like knocking on the door. And so we usually have four dogs in the house running around. Oh, and a cat, Romeo. This sounds like a reality series. You should have one. Yeah, without, yeah, it's a reality series that no one would watch, but I agree. <laughs> Trust me, we'd all be watching your reality series. Say about that. Thank you. You know, everyone I've spoken to during this pandemic who either lives with a partner or a family, they said it's been really eye-opening. What has these past nine months been like for you guys there? Well, I don't know if I have such a good answer about that. Um, <laughs> I don't, eye-opening. Um, I would just say we're both really impressed with our kid because, you know, we're kind of just doing what we always do, like put on shows and whatever. And, and you know, we're married, so we love each other, so we kind of hang out with each other, whereas she's an only child, and it's like, she doesn't want to hang out with her old parents, so we're just impressed that she hasn't had a complete breakdown just basically being in the house. <laughs> oh, maybe that's her calling to concur. But anyway, um, we're just impressed that she's 20 years old and she's not having a breakdown. Totally. What part of your house have you turned into a studio? Um, well, we had to break the news last night. Our friend, um, my really good friend, Jack Plotnick, that I wrote Disaster with, that you can see right there. Yeah. Whenever he comes to visit from LA, we always have, he's he's the one that's, is that my phone that keeps ringing? It may be. <laughs> no. Anyway, Jack always sleeps over and we always, we always give him Jack's room that we call Jack's room. And around four months ago, we converted it into our studio and he was on Stars in the House a couple nights ago. And we finally were like, Jack, you know where we're filming? And he's like, where downstairs? And we're like, no. And he's like, Jack's room. He's furious. So anyway, we've totally converted Jack's room into our, into our studio. So there's no room for him, but when, he's not going to come visit during the damn pandemic. So he can shove it when it's over. He can come visit. How savvy were you and James before the pandemic began or have, or has your tech savviness changed? Well, not at all, but I would say that, I mean, when I, when I came, you know, when I said to James, we should do, a, sh a live stream to help the actors fund. Yeah. I thought, you know, we'd have, you know, our singing stars come on and sing three songs and that would be it. And then James said, no, it should be more like a talk show. We began working together. But my point is my, the only way I could think to do it is that Kelly O'Hara was our first guest. I thought I was going to call Kelly O'Hara and literally keep it like that for the whole show. And she would be on my FaceTime and that would be the show because we had never experienced a split screen. We didn't know you could do something like that. And I was fine with it. I was like, well, people just watch my damn iPhone. And then James researched and found StreamYard, which now I know you guys use. And I definitely know how to do StreamYard. Like I feel very cool about that. And I definitely know what the word ethernet means. But beyond that, I, I'm i not tech savvy. You know, I, I literally, I feel like an old person, but I really don't know how to change the channel. He's always like, you know, get down to an Abbey setup. I'm like, I don't, I can't, I don't know what, I, I literally cannot figure out what streaming. So no, old person. You know, because we don't want to change anything. I just went to Ethernet. I mean, I live in a very big building with 900 apartments. You know, they call me Sticky Richie because sometimes you're sticky, which you know, with your internet, you're fine one moment that all of a sudden you freeze and someone's telling you a story and your eyes are closed because it's froze on you that way, right? It's so frustrating. Yeah, I thank God that, you know, we have these two young tech people that work yeah. with us, especially in my concert series, David Katz and Kieran Edwards and 
they they know how to do everything. I just basically sit back, but I really I don't understand how things work except for StreamYard. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing is I've had so many of your stars on from the Seth concert series and they're the same way. They're like, thank God Seth's sound crew sends us stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's like a new world. I mean, they really understand. I mean, and it's so funny because David Katz is not a tech pro. David Katz is like majoring in musical theater. But I think if you're just a young person, you just know how to do like Julie, even with TikTok, like I kind of know how to record a video, but she's like, our kid is like, all you need to do is, and I'm like, I can't. I'm, meanwhile, it works in the next generation because I bought my mother an iPhone and literally I keep saying, push the button to turn it on the side. It keeps going, the side. I go, no, literally the side of the phone, the side. I'm like, this is also a side. So like it, every generation is stupider. Like the older, the more, I'm very stupid, but my mother's extremely stupid. <laughs> I love it. There's always someone a little more stupider than we are. So we feel a little better. Yeah. You know, it's been a crazy nine months. You know, the New York theater shut down on March 12th. Like, where were you and James during that time period? How'd you find out that Broadway was shutting down? Well, a couple of days. I mean, we knew COVID was happening. I remember I had a birthday party and Jane Kukowski came over. It was February 29th. I think it was a birthday party. And she was like, this is the last party because of COVID. And we're all like, ha ha. Like, we wasn't really serious. We just knew it was happening and we were joking. And then around a week later, I, I, I was getting more and more nervous. And I had to fly to Scottsdale to do a show with, with Norm Lewis. Yeah. And it was I was definitely much more aware of things really getting messed up. It was around March 9th or March 10th. And Norm was like, I'm going to sing Misty now. And I want you to hold the hand of the person next to you. And I was like, unless they have COVID. But I wasn't really joking because I was like, why is Norm telling people to do that? Like, it actually is so dangerous right now. But I guess, you know, there was different levels of awareness. And I remember at the after party, like, I didn't want to shake anybody's hand. And the... Right before the concert began, I said to Mark, because it was a, a Sunday, and the next Sunday was or my concert with Kay Alice Settle in San Francisco. I said, what's the deal with that? I said, are they going to limit how many people can come? And he was like, why? What do you mean? I said, well, COVID's really affecting live performances. And Mark's like, I don't I don't think so. And literally by the end of Norman Lewis's concert, the theater had called Mark and canceled Kay Alice's concert. And he was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, he couldn't believe how quick it was. So that was, let's say, Saturday. And then my plan was to go to Texas, do a political fundraiser, and then fly to go do a Chaos concert. So that was off, but we still had to go to Texas. So James and I flew down to Texas on, I think it was a Wednesday. We did this political fundraiser to help out this woman, Ann Johnson, who, by the way, won. Thumbs up. And while we were there, we heard that Broadway shut down. So then we flew home the next day, got to our house Friday. On Saturday, I said we should start doing a live stream. And then on Monday, Stars in the House began. Yeah, because I was going to ask you, I mean, how did you and James, like, come up with this right away? I mean, what a brilliant idea to do. And I mean, the first episode was March 16th, right? It was that Monday. Yeah, whatever that Monday is. Yeah, I guess it's 16th. Um, well, um, you know, I was really in dire, dire financial straits because all my money is made doing live concerts and Broadway cruises. In other words, super spreaders. So I was like, oh, my God, like, I'm not going to make any money this year. But then I was like you know, people are much worse shape than I am. So I knew I was like, God, the Actors Fund is going to be inundated with requests. And right around that time, I saw a tweet from Jen Cody. And she was like, you know, people really need help. Someone needs to do something. And she tagged all these people, but she didn't tag me. And I was furious. Like, why would you think of me? Pitch. So anyway, I said to James, I was like, Jen Cody had the nerve not to think of me to do something. I was like, just for that, I'm going to do something. So I said, you know, we should start. I said, we should do some kind of fundraiser for the Actors Fund. And I'll just get my friends to sing songs. And James said, well, it can't just be three songs because it should be more complete and we should have like talking segments in between. And co coinciding with that, around five, seven days before something, Dr. John LaPook from CBS News had called. He had interviewed us after What the World Is Now Is Love and his father-in-law is Norman Lear and Norman came to see Disaster and really loved it and told them to go see it. So we have this kind of nice family connection. Anyway, he said, can you guys do something and help save the world? And we're like, what? He said, can you come up with a hand-washing song? Because COVID's really getting serious and people need to take hand-washing seriously. So we started working on it right before we left for Texas. And, you know, we're so naive back then. We're like, we're going to get together like a cast of 50 people in a studio to sing it. Like, you know, we didn't know that it was spread that way. And LaPoo called on Monday to figure out how to do the song. And I said, we can't really talk today. I said, because we're starting a live stream tonight at eight o'clock. And he said, oh, he goes, well, I can come on and, give some update on what's happening with COVID. We're like, oh my God, that'd be great to have a medical break. Like little did we know 300 shows later, he would be there every single day giving us medical upgrades. So it just, it's one of those just organic things that happen. And 
I don't remember talking about doing it twice a day. I, I mean, we both kind of blame each other for that idea. I don't remember who came because I always go not since Vaudeville two a day. But I know that James, I think James said, well, it should be two o'clock and eight o'clock like a regular Broadway show. And then it became just every day, two o'clock and eight o'clock. So we did that for around three or four months. And then finally, when people started going back to work, we're like, we shouldn't do shows during the day anymore because no one's really around anymore during the day. So now we just do the shows eight o'clock at night. But um, we raised, I don't know, I probably ran six, $625,000 at this point for the Actors Fund. I was going to say congratulations, first of all, on doing this. I mean, what you two have done is what Judy and Mickey, you know, would have done a long time ago. Seriously, but you saved so many people. And having the doctor on every day, that was our insight into what was going on with COVID. Because the entertainment industry was sort of left by the wayside that the government didn't care about. So we watched your show every day and got an honest update of what was happening. So it was also entertaining having him talk about so we felt a little safer and you raised so much money at the same time. Yeah, to me, like, the best thing he ever said was, I think it was even the first day. Yeah. He, said, he said, it isn't an extinction event. He said, it's going to have a beginning, a middle and an end. And once he said that, it just made it much easier to deal with because it's like, we just have to kind of deal with it till it ends. But it wasn't like, this is the new normal forever. It really, once he said that, everything else, I, I didn't mind as much because I was like, okay, good. I could deal with this for like a year or however the hell long it takes. A year run, a year in the life of a show. <laughs> yeah, basically. So, so what have you been like almost 300 shows already? Yeah, maybe between 250, 300, I can't remember. But, you know, we not only do starts in the house, and then we're doing plays in the house and plays in the house junior, but it's all part of the same franchise. So yeah. um, we had our 200th episode, but that was months ago. I don't know, uh, if two, between two and 300. Yeah, but just talk about that number of money that you raised for the Actors Fund, because you know normally during this time of year when a show is running, Broadway Cares does their red buckets and the Actors Fund does their same thing. There was no money coming in to give back to the community, yet you helped raise, like you said, over like six hundred and thirty, yeah, six hundred thirty thousand dollars. I mean, what does that mean to you? How proud are you guys of that? Well, um, thanks for saying that. Uh, we're more just so thankful to people because. I just can't believe people are donating in this time. So, I mean, we really thought donations would just stop and that we would just sort of be a way for people to meet and kind of feel good, but we can't believe people are still donating. And then on top of that, after the horrific George Floyd murder, we spent the month of June raising money for NAACP um, Legal Defense Fund. So we stopped a month of fundraising for the Actors Fund and did uh, NAACP. And then within these, however many months it's been, we've had these one night fundraisers for cancer support community and for um, the Humane Society and for the Gay and Lesbian Synagogue. So it's been nice. It's been, we sort of have a platform where we can focus. We, it's always about the Actors Fund usually, but then every once in a while we'll have another charity. And um, to answer your question, I can't believe people are still giving money, but that's what's amazing about people, I guess. <laughs> You know, every dollar turns into five dollars, turns into ten dollars, turns into a hundred dollars, which then turns into thousands of dollars. I mean, every little bit helps. So anybody watching from around the world, please go and give money to Stars in the House for the Actors Fund. What an incredible organization that they've looked out for the, the you know, the theatrical, the entertainment community. Also, I want to talk about the James and Seth game night on Stars in the House. Did you just kick that off last week? Yeah, we can't believe yeah, we can't believe it's working. I mean, basically, you know, James, James really does all the, the sort of business. And he's the one that we had this little staff of volunteers when we began Stars in the House doing social media and tech. And he was like, he said, this is going to last a long time because we can't ask people to do two shows a day and just keep volunteering. He said, we have to start paying them. So we got a grant first from the Berlanti um, Foundation, Family Foundation, um, Greg Berlanti and his husband, Robbie Rogers. And then Sirius XM picked us up and now they're paying for the show to be done. And with that money, James and I, we don't get any money, but we give that money to our staff. So anyway, some of the other money comes from um, this thing called Your Kids, Our Kids, which is our foundation, which we found out a couple years ago. So we fronted a lot of the money. So when the holidays came, James said, we really should give our staff, we should give our staff like an actual vacation, like a paid vacation instead of being like horrible slumlords. So we said, give them pay vacation. So he said, what can we do that's really easy for a week? He goes, why don't we just do game nights? So two things, we're, we're raising money for our foundation this week. It's basically like a pledge drive so that we have enough money to cover the um, our staff when they come back. So we've been raising money for our foundation, your kids, our kids over this week. And we did game night for the first time on Saturday night thinking like, is anybody gonna wanna watch a bunch of 
Broadway stars and or my close friends play games. Anyway, we raised so much money. People are watching like people watch like writing from London. Like I woke up this morning and watch like it's crazy. So tonight we have um it's combination. It's like a what are those things called? Um, not Punnett Squares, where the two circles go over each other. It's basically two different reunions. It's a Rosie O'Donnell show reunion because it's me, Rosie O'Donnell, and Judy Gold. We all work together in the Rosie O'Donnell show, but it's also a Susical reunion because it's Rosie O'Donnell, Kevin Chamberlain, Anne Harada, and Janine Lamana. So we're it's so fun. I mean, I loved having game nights, and now we get to raise money doing it. So anyway, we're doing it this whole week, and on New Year's Eve, we're gonna do. We were talking about doing just regular New Year's Eve show, and then for some reason. I thought of Andy Nyman, my British friend, and James was saying, oh, it's going to be midnight there at a different time. So James finally said, why don't we celebrate midnight in all different time zones? So we're going to do a, a New Year's Eve show that celebrates it when it turns midnight in London, New Year's Eve show on the East Coast, and then one more show for the West Coast New Year's Eve. So that's going to begin at like 1 a.m. our time. So anyway, so we're going to do three shows on New Year's Eve. That is crazy fun i mean didn't you and james meet originally at a game night at a friend's house yes very good yeah our friend dj salisbury who we i i really didn't know him very well at all but he i was on like all these dating sites and he saw my it was a singles game night so and which is like literally my dream come true because it's like i don't want to go to a bar or anything i love game nights so he said i saw your face on like match.com he said i recognize you from the business you want to come to our game night for single guys and i was like yeah so I came to it. It was at, it was actually, it wasn't a friend's house. It was through a friend, but it was at um, uh, East of 8th, that restaurant at 23rd yeah. 8th Avenue. And um, it was all these cute single guys. I mean, I was loving it. And James had just moved to New York with, uh, he just adopted Julie yeah. and he had a babysitter, which he never does. So he actually went out that night and saw a movie and he came late. And um, the way we bonded, I guess, is we were playing apples to apples, which is a person the leader puts out an adjective, like let's say like um, annoying. And then people around the table put out a noun that they think works with that adjective. And then the leader picks the best combination. And sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's serious. Anyway, James was playing and he put down important. So I looked through all my different nouns and I put down Israel. And when it got to his turn, he rejected Israel. And I said, who's the new guy who's an anti-Semite? And it actually got a big, I thought he was gonna get offended, but he laughed and I was like, oh my God, he gets my hostility. And um, I was doing the Rosie O'Donnell cruises at that time. And he mentioned he had a daughter. And I said, oh, by the way, I wasn't even, it's funny. It's like, I wasn't even like, oh, I want to date this guy. But I just, and we had a daughter. And I said, oh, you'd love this cruise because for gay guys and their kids. And um, I gave him, I said, I can get you a discount. And we exchanged emails. And then I wrote to him on New Year's Eve. Oh my God, I forgot it was New Year's Eve actually when I wrote him. And he wrote me back this really nice, like three paragraph email. And it was so polite. And I said, oh, you're such a nice guy. Why don't we go on a date? Because I was just being very kind of open-minded. And then we had like two dates and I was like, I thought I was gonna have like a whole year of like dating a million different people. But after two dates, I was like, I guess we're getting married. And we did. Are you both really good at games? Um, no, um, I'm really good at games. I'm also really, really competitive. Yeah. He's not bad at games, but it doesn't really matter to him. Yeah. So he knows my incredible competitiveness. Let's just say it's not, it, he doesn't ever wanna be on my team. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. I thought he wanted to be on your team to sort of be like, oh, I'm on the winning team. I don't necessarily win. I just am very competitive. I love it. Well, that's good. That's like, I won in my own way. I'm competitive. I guess. I think I'm just unpleasant to play with. But regardless. Well, you obviously have a lot of friends because like, all, all these stars come on your your game night, which I think is really amazing. Yeah, it's really fun. I'm, I'm just like beyond loving it. So we're, and we're not going to do it. We're not going to make it like a weekly event because it, it's people love watching it. I mean, it's so fun. I don't know if you saw last night, but I, no. it's so weird because you you don't know what you're saying. And like James was doing charades and I, I was like, a play. And then he held a microphone and I was like, a singing play. And after everyone's like, why did you say musical? And I was like, why? What did I say? They go, you said a singing play. I'm like, I don't remember saying that. And then I watched the video. Why didn't I know what the word musical is? A singing play. Anyway, I, I'm competitive, but not that good. No, but I love that though. That's going to be a new, like, you know, so, so, and so in a singing, a new singing play as opposed to a new musical or a new musical comedy. That's like a musical I love that. A singing play. <laughs> well, a lot of people like Lady Day could be considered a singing play, right? Thank you. See, that's what I thought the winner, the, the answer was going to be when he said play. I thought it was going to be like, Lady Day, and then you would have gotten it a singing play. Oh, 
contact, the dance, what was that, like a dance musical. You're totally right. That's really interesting. Okay, well, you know what? I stand by my answer then. Thank you. Always stand by your answer. So was it James' idea to do plays in the house? Um, basically, Tina yeah. Fey was doing our show and Tina Fey wrote us and she was like, by the way, Matthew Broderick and Sarah Jessica Parker are in their apartment and they could just do their play from their apartment. And then she was like, if they won't do it, I'll do it. Parentheses, I won't do it, which I thought was very funny. And then, so we were just sort of thinking, oh, you really could do a play from your house, I guess. And then Carol Kane, uh, who does Kimmy Schmidt with Tina Fey, wrote to Tina and said, I want to do something for the Actors Fund. And Tina said, contact Seth and James. She yeah. wrote us and then she said, my friends, Brooke Adams and Tony Shalhoub want to do something. And we're like, well, maybe they could do a play. And I said to James, I said, oh, I saw Brooke Adams do Heidi Chronicles. We should have them do Heidi Chronicles. So James called them and was working it out. And then finally Brooke Adams said, well, I was just your replacement in Heidi Chronicles. You should have the original cast if you can. So I said, oh, that's so I called Peter Friedman. And then he said, oh my God, it's been 25 years, but I'll do it again. So I don't know. It was kind of just, we all kind of thought of it. And then suddenly the, we did tell the allergist wife and it began this regular thing. But we stopped doing it. You know, we did it for a long time, but we just stopped doing it because basically we were the first, not to brag, but we were. And then like everyone else is doing it and they're doing a great job. So it's like, we don't have the need, not the need. I just feel like let them like get all the audience. Like we don't, it's just not worth it for us anymore to put all this work into when there are a million theater companies that by the way really do need the money. And anyway, so all these theater companies are now doing their own plays and we've sort of like stopped. Yeah, but you start, you kicked it off for them to say, oh my God, they do it so well. We should be, we could do it, you know, for our theater company to raise money. So you sort of started the trend. I mean, whether we did it well or not, I think we made people realize it's possible to do a play where you're acting straight ahead. You're not looking at, I mean, like we, it made people realize, wow, we can enjoy these plays just with people reading in boxes. So I think it opened the door for people to realize that it works and it does. Yeah. I have to talk about you and James hosting because you've never worked with a sidekick before. No. And you're, you're happy. All right. So let's, you two are so wonderful and it's so fun to watch the two of you together. I keep saying we have to give big shout outs to your husband. If your husband ever wants to come on here, if he's in the other room, bring him in if he wants to come in. But you two are so funny and so wonderful together. What, uh, what was it like? When did you find your yin and your yang like sitting there together saying, boy, we can do this together or be quiet. I'm going to raise my hand. I want to say something. I mean, <laughs> well, it's funny. David Friedman wrote me and David Friedman said he has a lot more signals with his husband, Sean. He has, because James has, James will do this like underneath the camera, meaning like, I want to say something. But David Friedman has like hand on the leg means let me finish. Like hand on the shoulder means stop interrupting me. Like they literally have, he wrote me the whole thing. So we don't have that. We just have like basically because I, I'm so used to doing a talk show like you are and like you're always making sure you think ahead to the next question. So while someone's talking, I'm like, I know exactly what I'm going to say next. But if James does his finger up, I go, oh, good. I can relax. He's got something he wants to talk about. So that's kind of the only system we really have, I guess. It's just like, I I usually, I guess, lead it because I'm just used to, I've been doing talk shows since, you know, my God, Chatterbox began in 1999. So I've been doing it for a long time. So it's just, it's a little weird for me. You know, I've never been Kathleen Regis, but um, it's also... It's also nicer, and it's funny because there've been a couple of shows he couldn't do with me, and I definitely was like, "Oh my god, it's exhausting!" Like it's much easier to actually have him. Like, so I guess we are a nice balance with each other. You're a perfect balance, and like you said, at the 297th show, you're like, "I'm so glad I have someone else to do this with." Yes, Queen. <laughs> totally. Well, we also have a chat about your very successful um, Seth concert series, which of course is, you know, produced by Mark Hortali and is sponsored by Broadway World and StreamYard. I mean, what an incredible series. What has this series meant to you having it virtually during this whole time? How much fun are you having? Well, it's so interesting. It's one of those, I mean, well, I'll go back for one second. I'll just say that, you know, it was the spring and it was still like Broadway's coming back April 15th. You know, there was a lot of that happening. And I wrote to Mark and I said, you know, we have all these concerts planned in Provincetown. I was like, I don't think they're going to happen. And he was like, well, not necessarily. And by the way, they, they were able to continue live performing in Provincetown, but not the way yeah. it would have been too difficult. So finally I said, we've got to bring it online. And I said, I said, and we've got to, again, I said, we've got to be the first. Cause I said, it, people are going to figure out they're going to have to start doing live concerts. I said, we've got to figure it out. So, um, David Catcher does our tech. I basically said to David, I said, let's mix it up. And I said, I'll pre-record some piano parts and send it to the singers. And then others will make videos and we'll, you know, we'll edit them. But David, to, before I even knew it, found this app where he was, he's like, we can sing live at the same time. So we spent like 
hours every day where he'd be on screen, I'd be like, and he'd be like, lift up your head. For some reason, we were always doing either Suddenly Seymour or Oh, Good Things You Can Think. I don't know why those are the two songs. I guess because he played those roles when he was kids. So we kept trying those songs and something kept going wrong. Like my ethernet wasn't strong. So then we had to, my computer wasn't good. So he lives in Connecticut. We had to meet halfway and like change computers. Either it was so relentless, but but he kept trying it. He really kept persisting, David, that we could do it live. And then Kelly started rehearsing, and I said, Kelly said, I, I think I could play for you live. Let's try something. So we did So we did Cockat Optimus and we sang it once. And Kelly, she said, Oh my God, she said, I'm crying because I feel like when a deaf person gets like a cochlear implant, because this is my first time singing live with a pianist in three months. So we tried it again and then something went wrong. So then the next day we're having a final tech rehearsal and things kind of kept glitching a little bit. And we're like, you know what? It may be safer to just videotape these. And James was watching yeah. and James came downstairs and he said, listen, he said, we are so starved for live performing. He said, it doesn't matter if there are technical glitches. He goes, it's so magical to find, to see something live happen again. He goes, you have to make these concerts live. Even if they're mistakes, you have to do them live. Yeah. So we, we do it. And I, I think people don't realize that it's live when they see them advertised because most concerts now are pre-filmed and shown, but they're totally live. And that's what makes them amazing because we, we always wind up segueing into songs that we weren't planning and then we get people's comments. So anyway, what it means to me is just like, it's one of the benefits of COVID. It's like as bad as COVID is, my sister Nancy lives in Baltimore. She's never able to come to Provincetown. She's never able to see my series in London. Like she's seeing every single concert finally. Like it's so great. Like, cause I'm like, you never saw my concert with Audra. I'm like, I've done it like 30 times, but she's never seen it. So what I love is that people around the world are now seeing these concerts that you can only see if you were in that city, in that theater that one night. So it's as bad as COVID is, it's been amazing because it's spread this series around the world. That's what all your guests have told me that I've had the week they do their concerts with you. First of all, singing live again has been the best thing for them. Being with you, they're like, I've known Seth forever. I mean, this is something I have to ask you. I thought I knew everything about your showbiz career. And I've had some of these people on. I'm like, what? So Carrie Butler was on last week. And I didn't realize you two have known each other forever. So she started to tell me a story about you were at a summer camp where all these Broadway kids were at. They all had T-shirts on with the Broadway show that they had done. And you two were the only two that didn't. Please tell our audience that story of what that was like. Okay, your, your version is a little operator where it gets changed just slightly. Basically, in the, in the 80s, there was, an, uh, a, it was a, a dessert nightclub. So it's a nightclub that only served desserts called something different in the East eighties. I went to high school with a girl named Barbara Brass, whose cousin was Stacy Lynn Brass, who was the swing and Annie. So Barbara said, Oh, my cousin is doing this kids cabaret for kids that are on Broadway every weekend. And I was like, I want to do that. So, you know, before the internet, I guess I found out where the auditions were. I went in to go audition. And I got cast and it was basically a cabaret. We did four shows every weekend for kids that were in Broadway shows. So it was, you know, kids in Annie, Peter Pan, Avita, I Remember Mama, all the shows back then. And that's where we met, like, you know, Sarah Jessica Parker had just left Annie. So she was in it, Allison Smith was in it, Diana Barrows. And the mortifying part that Carrie's talking about is that they did cast kids from Broadway shows, but they also just cast kids who were talented, I guess like me and Carrie. And during the finale, We'd all get up and everyone would be like, Annie, Peter Pan, they'd all have their show t-shirts on. And Carrie and I were just like a Hanes white depressing t-shirt we weren't allowed to wear. It was so mortifying. And I kept trying to sneak in. I'd done Oliver at the North States Dinner Theater, which was professional. So I was like, Oliver. And they were like, it's not Broadway. Take it the hell off. So that was the horrible part. So Carrie and I have known each other back since then. But weirdly, she stayed the same age and I've actually gotten older. But she's still around 21 years old and it's annoying. Uh, wait, you did Oliver at North Stage. Okay, I was brought up in Glen Cove. That was my first big job. I worked, I opened it with Funny Girl. Damn Yankee was a Julie Newmar. I got to know her. Dolores Gray became one of my dearest friends during Gypsy. Alan Jones mm -hmm. in Man of La Mancha. Patrick Swayze I used to hang out with every night. Oh, you and I have got to catch up about North oh Stage. Oh my God, it's so weird. I just heard from John Butts who was the Beatle in my production. Yeah. He was like, I was just talking with Shaney Wallace because Shaney Wallace yeah. was our Nancy. And he was like, I told Shaney Wallace how successful you are. 
that's so I Oliver like changed my life. Oh my god, I love that production. All right, let's just talk about North Stage. Look like the new Amsterdam meets the Winter Garden. I mean, that was the best. I don't. I have the best. I have so you and I will do a whole other show with just talking about North Stage stories. I watched every performance of Dolores Gray do Gypsy there during the Christmas season. Oh my God! Well, it was beautiful theater. Like we had like the original Broadway set. I mean, it was gorgeous. They should have let you wear that shirt. Hello, it's North Stage. You should have just put it on. <laughs> well, I definitely, I definitely overwore that shirt and bragged nonstop because there was a whole group of kids in high school that nicknamed me Ollie because I was always wearing my Oliver shirt. And they were like, hey, Ollie. So I think I overwore the shirt and people had had it with me even at the kids' nightclub. So I, I appreciate it. I was annoyed. Oliver and North Stage, you go, you go, you celebrate. That That goes to the top of your resume now, Seth. Okay, Anna Gasteyer was here. Anna, I absolutely adore. Where did you two meet? You've been like the dearest friends forever. Did you meet like it? When you were doing the Rosie O'Donnell show? Yeah, she, we were, um, Rosie O'Donnell show was on the eighth floor of 30 Rock. So we, the writer's room was on one end and oh. Studio 8H for Saturday Night Live was on, on the other end. So we would watch, I would watch the feed of Saturday Night Live and hear her sing and be like, God, that girl is amazing. And then, so I knew she was funny and I don't really have any boundaries sort of. And I guess I just think people just have the same, same sense of humor as I do. So when you join the gym at NBC, they give you these like weird blue shorts and like this NBC just, this horrible, like, I, I guess, because they think people don't have their own gym clothes. So I, I was at the gym and I just saw her and I, she was wearing it. And I said, I think I said like, nice, nice wearing the assigned, I think I said nice wearing the assigned shorts. It was some past of comment that I couldn't believe she was wearing it. And instead of being like, how dare you, who are you? She was like, ha ha ha. And we just became friends. And that was 1998, I guess. So we've been friends since then. She is the best. There were sides of her I didn't know until I sat with her. I mean, another, such an incredible, incredible person. You know, throughout the stars in the house, what was the biggest pinch me moment for you so far, Seth? Because you and James have had everybody on from re reunions of Broadway shows, TV shows, every major star in the world has been on stars in the house. There has to be a pinch me moment where you were like, I can't believe we're getting these people on our show. Um, I think, hold on a second, I just got a text. Yeah. Doing, uh, your because you have a big sound check today with Alex Brightman, don't you? Yes, that was actually Alex texting me. Um, Tell him you're with Richie Ridge right now. You're doing your, you're doing your show with him. He I was am. To, 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 Alex did my show as soon as the pandemic started. He was so great. He sat with me for an hour. But we'll talk oh, about him before we leave this because he's your show, of course, this Sunday. But go back to what you were talking about. The biggest pinch me person you've had on the show or Definitely. one of them. You know, like one of the things I love is quote unquote deconstructing and it's not just yeah. music I deconstruct, it's also definitely comedy. And yeah. I, what it is for me is I just love saying, oh my God, here is what I'm obsessed with about what you do. So the comedy show that probably meant the most to me growing up, besides Carol Burnett's show was SCTV. So when I had like, it's Catherine O'Hara, Andrew Martin, Martin Short, Eugene Levy, and I was able to show Catherine O'Hara this clip of her as Lola Heatherton, and analyze what was brilliant. And then she even like said something to the effect of like, something like, I can't believe you noticed that. It was something where she was appreciating my deconstruction. I could not believe it because it's something that I've been quoting for like 30 years and to actually be able to play for her and go, here is why I'm obsessed with it. It was unbelievable. It was one of my most favorite moments of my whole life. That is terrific. You know, besides having Carrie Butler, Adam Pascal was here a few weeks ago. Also, two of your stars from Disaster, which is one of my favorite musicals that you, of course, created with Jack Plotnick. And of course, you co-starred in. What was it like starring on Broadway in that musical with that crazy group of the finest Broadway stars? It was a mixed bag. I mean, it was amazing in so many ways because it was basically all my friends. I wrote the show because I read Charles Bush's book. Horse of Lost Atlantis. Mm -hmm. And he created Vampire Lessons of Sodom just for himself and his friends. And I was like, I want to do something like that. And that's why I wrote Disaster. So it was amazing that I was able to just basically text the whole cast and be like, do you want to do a Broadway show? Mm -hmm. So that was amazing. It it was hard because also being a writer, you know, like Lynn would sit out of Hamilton and like watch Javi once a week, but I didn't really want to, I didn't want to miss any shows. Like I love performing, but it was really hard to be constantly acting. And, you know, I, I'm not neurotic that I just keep changing things, but I think I keep refining things so they get better. So the whole time I kept making changes. So it was very hard to be present. I mean, there's one classic moment where like, 
it was such a stupid joke, but like right after the earthquake, Faith Prince would say to Kevin, like, where does it hurt? And he'd be like, right there. It was such a stupid joke, but it always got a laugh off Broadway. And we went to Broadway and it wasn't getting a laugh. So I was with Roger Bart backstage and I was like, I said, that always got a laugh off Broadway. I don't know why it's not. I said, I think maybe Faith is not gesturing big enough. And as I'm saying all this, I begin to hear like, Ted. And I was like, huh? And it was literally my entrance. And Rachel York was just on stage going, Ted, Ted. And the audience is hearing, I don't know why Faith is not getting a laugh. I mean, off, like my mic is on. And I'm just, so that's what was hard. It was like constantly separating myself from the writer to the actor. And I tried to just be an actor during the show, but I couldn't because. I had to be listening for laughs, but end of the story is it was incredible. It was like the most amazing experience ever. Like it was my dream come true. Cause I got to co-write something and be in it and be doing the music. It was like, um, it was my, literally my dream come true. So yeah. thank you for asking. Well, I think Carrie Butler said the one of the biggest thrills for her, besides doing it with all of you, was waiting in the wings before, right as, as everyone was making their first entrances, and like Roger and you and Kevin are all just like laughing and and just shooting the breeze and doing this strange comedy stuff, which I think everybody does in shows before they go on. And so that was one of the biggest highlights. I mean, was watching you all be just so goofy and make this stuff up, and then walk out there and do your thing. Kevin would always play this character, this like old British actor, where we. <laughs> They would call for places and he would go, places? I just heard half hour. It's such a stupid joke. Dresser? And then Roger would do this stupid joke that where he was like, uh, this famous joke he had, he always, we always made him tell, he was like, I was walking down, I was on the beach and I suddenly saw an oyster making love with a lobster. And everyone couldn't believe watching these two different species make love to each other. And after it was over, the lobster crawled away and we went over to the oyster and we're like, oyster, what, why Why did you have sex with that lobster? And she was like, oh, I don't know if you've ever had sex with a lobster. But the oyster said, when, when the lobster put his arms around me, my pearls. <laughs> this stupidest joke. And then we'd be doing the show and I'd be talking to Roger in character and he would just start going. But of course the audience wouldn't know what it was. Anyway, there was a lot of goofiness. It was just a fun, fun time, man. Yeah. Well, we were just saying the other day, I told Carrie, I said, disaster, when, when Broadway comes back, I hope someone puts it back up again because it's something we need, an incredible feel-good 70s disaster musical. That was, I used to go like once a week. I went to all your sing-alongs when you had all the people do their things after the show. It was one of those fabulous things to do. Oh, that was so great. That was a fundraiser for Broadway Cares because yeah. we, we, you know, instead of just doing the Red Bucket, we had so many famous people on our show that originated classic roles. So we'd basically say, who in the audience, we're going to auction off like Roger singing, Roger, Adam singing from Rent or Roger Bart singing from Hercules. Yeah. And then once you give enough money, you'll get to come on stage and they'll sing it to you. And it raised so much money for Broadway Cares. It was such a fun idea. I wish more Broadway shows would do it. It was so fun and easy. Yeah. That's great. You know, talking about Sirius XM Broadway, how incredible that they're paying your staff and everything else. What a wonderful, wonderful series. Talk about the two wonderful radio shows that you do. How enjoyful is that of, of them for you to do, Seth? Do you do them twice a day? Well, two things. Sirius XM, the, the yeah. radio station, Stars in the House is actually on Stars. It's a different channel. It's interesting, uh, like all different channels. So Stars in the House is on Stars. I do the Broadway radio show, yeah. I'm an afternoon host. So Christine Petty is the morning host. I'm on channel 72 in the afternoon. And then I do my own talk show, but I do my own talk show also on stars because I just didn't want to limit myself to just having Broadway guests, even though I have a lot of Broadway guests, but like I have like Jane Goodall. Like I like just having a variety of guests. So I do that on stars and then every place on the Broadway channel. But in terms of do I love it? Yeah, I mean, when I was at Oberlin, I did a Broadway radio show um, where I would play records and stuff and I taped it. And my mother would always say to me, you know, you should have your own Broadway radio show. And I'd be like, where? I'm like, what Broadway, where am I gonna have my own Broadway radio? It was such a bizarre, she would always say that to me. And I'm like, I, what What model are you asking me to follow? Like, it's not like there's another Broadway radio show where I can, so I was like, you're a crazy person. And then um, I arbitrarily got that gig and um, it it's great because it's like, I get to like, I get to introduce music to the country. And and one of my favorite things is like you, Richie, just like saying, oh, isn't this person great? Like I love playing music and telling people, this is why something is amazing. So it's a great gig, I love it. Well, it's wonderful because you have worldwide fans that watch you, listen to you all around the world. And of course, watch you on all your shows. We are just about out of time, but what are you looking forward to the most in 2021? <sighs> Interesting. Uh, so I'm so reflective. I don't know. Um, 
I don't know. There's been so much sadness in 2020. <laughs> you know, it's like I just, I'd like to appreciate. I'd like to appreciate where I am, and um, that's really probably it. You know, I'm getting sad. Like I think of Rebecca Luker. It's like I just yeah, think yeah. like you know, like how sad things are, and like and how unappreciative we are of how easy it is for us to just have a great life. So I really hope that I'm more appreciative. And not complain about stupid things. I guess that's what I would say. I think we all will. I think, you know, this is the new now of just connecting this way. And I cannot wait for all of us to get back in front of an audience or with someone to hug them again and hug the people we miss the most, you know, and, 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 and celebrate the people we lost this year. But I mean, I think, I think 2021 has to be a better year than 2020 with the new regime going into the White House and everything else and with the vaccine and everything else and getting closer to opening up theaters. I cannot wait to sit in a house again or a nightclub and just listen to listen to all these incredible people do what they all do, right? Including yourself. I, yeah, and I just miss, you know, I miss um, like Gypsy of the Year, like yes. just rehearsing like rehearsing with a big fun, bunch of dancers and i miss that so much as being in a room and like let's run the number again like i can't wait to do that it's going to happen just a little longer but we're going to get there you know well this coming sunday night january 3rd at 8 p.m eastern standard time seth will be live with alex brightman who of course is on my show at the early part of the pandemic and then a rebroadcast on monday january 4th at 3 p.m eastern standard time and there's also a very special vip sound check ticket which i think is fabulous that you offer because i mean you think about fans that never get a chance to see how it's all put together or like you said of of syncing all of this stuff and then you know they just see when the curtain goes up and now you let them go behind the scenes of the two of you just you know doing what you do best and you know whatever happens that's got to be so enjoyable for you it's fun because we run stuff that we don't necessarily do in the concert it's really fun having an audience there actually i i love having people at the sound check i love it yeah well this series is produced by mark cortali and is sponsored by broadway world and streamer i didn't mean to make you cry but like i said i feel the same way i get so emotional just by thinking of all the people just people we've lost and things we can't do you uh-huh. know yeah. but i also want to mention now through january 3rd there is a seth holiday bundle which features 15 shows for $15 each. Now, this includes Audrey McDonald, Cheyenne Jackson, Jesse Mueller, Adam Pascal, Orfe and Andy Carl, Beth Level, Kiala Settle, LaShans, Lilius White, Liz Calloway, Rachel Bay Jones, Judy Kuhn, Beth Malone, Karen Olivo, and Melissa Errico. That is $15 a show for all of them, or you can buy a ticket for $20 each. The tickets are available at the SethConcerts.com or at Broadway World Events. Seth, this has been great catching up with you. So great seeing you, Richard. It's so, so, so great. And we'll see each other in person again soon, please, God. Send our love to Alex Brightman. Everybody tune in this Sunday at 8 p.m. or Monday at 3 p.m. for a rebroadcast of a Seth concert series with Alex Brightman. Seth, love to your husband, to your daughter, to your mother-in-law, to your menagerie. I'm going to call you Dr. Doolittles. That's what I'm going to call you from now on. Thank you. Dr. Doolittles. Everybody stay safe, wear a mask, wash your hands, and uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Bye, guys.